Hi there, it's nice to meet you. My name is Rebecca McClellan and I'm a genetic counselor at both Kennedy Krieger and Johns Hopkins. Um, and I'm pleased to be with you today as part of the family planning toolkit to talk with you about the intervention or family planning option of no intervention. So as I mentioned, my name is Rebecca McClellan and I'm a certified genetic counselor. I work um, both at Kennedy Krieger in the metabolism clinic um, and also at Johns Hopkins where I'm part of the Center for Inherited Heart Diseases. Um, my connection to the X-linked um, carrier community is primarily through a condition called Barth syndrome. Um, and I've worked very closely with um, patients and families um, who have Barth syndrome for nearly 20 years. I also currently serve as one of the um, members of the medical advisory board for Remember the Girls. So what exactly do we mean when we say no intervention in the context of family planning choices? Um, and this really, for some people, is hard to define and hard to think about. So I wanted to take a second and touch on this. Um, in my opinion, this really means it's making an active decision to have a child after you know that there's a recurrence risk, but you are choosing to do so without any reproductive interventions or testing. So when or why would someone um, choose to pursue this as an option? And the, very, the reasons for this are numerous and can be really personal. Um, I'm gonna share with you uh, many of them that I have heard throughout my career and many of them that I think can come up, um, but there may definitely be other reasons that people would decide not to do any type of intervention. Um, so the first would include a, a clear religious conflict with some of the available reproductive testing options. So these would be, you know, religious reasons where someone might be opposed of uh, embryos needing to be discarded kind of as a byproduct of, um, you know, pre-implantation genetic testing. Um, this may be someone who is absolutely opposed to religiously the risk of a prenatal um, procedure causing a miscarriage, things like that. So there could be some very clear religious reasons that people would um, choose to make a choice of no intervention. Um, it also could be an emotional discomfort um, with the available reproductive options that are out there. Um, financial limitations um, could definitely be a problem. Insurance does not cover all of the reproductive testing or family planning options that are out there. So um, for some things, uh, it could be that there is not a financial way for uh, a couple to um, pursue or choose an option that they might otherwise. Service access limitations is also another issue. Um, depending on where you live in the world and in the United States, um, what tests test you have available to you and what options you have available may certainly be limited. Um, for example, there is one very specific type of pre-implantation genetic testing that is available uh, overseas, but not here in the United States. So something called polar body biopsy testing. Um, so there are definitely, depending on where you live and what services and the way that your healthcare system is established and set up might impact um, your availability of your different testing options and might lead you then to make a choice of not um, pursuing any of those options. Lastly, I wanted to touch on just um, faith um, and religious beliefs, um, not necessarily directly opposed to the different options, but maybe the idea that what's meant to be is going to be. Um, so many women um, and families will choose not to pursue um, any family planning options or reproductive testing options because they feel like whatever is going to happen is going to happen. Um, and that is actually not an uncommon and not an, an, it's definitely a very valid reason for a couple to make the decision that they'd like to make. So what are some of the risks uh, to consider if you decide you're going to pursue no intervention? Um, and Risk is kind of a hard way to think about this, but I do feel strongly that if you decide not to do any intervention, it's still important to talk with your medical team that knows your diagnosis and your condition well. Um, there are, um, you know, in some conditions, but not all, um, situations where um, setting up a delivery plan and kind of talking about some other things that might need to happen sort of during the pregnancy or during delivery 
um, to help make sure the baby is safe could still be important, even if you are deciding not to do, um, you know, prenatal testing or pre, uh, pre-implantation genetic testing or anything like that. So I've listed just a few examples here to give you a sense of what we're talking about. Um, so the first would be an X-linked ichthyosis. Um, so women, it's been shown that women who give birth to sons um, with X-linked ichthyosis may experience a delay or a failure of labor to initiate. Um, the enzyme change can basically cause a decrease in the production of maternal estriol in late in the pregnancy, and this can sometimes impact labor and delivery. So having a conversation with your providers and kind of knowing that, um, it could be uh, something that's important to kind of make sure you're planning for and kind of thinking about. Another example is hemophilia, which is also an excellent condition where there can be a serious bleeding risk for women after delivery. So women who are carriers of hemophilia, um, there can be sort of a bleeding risk. Uh, and there can also be a risk of intracranial hemorrhage to the baby itself. Um, so sometimes there are very special safety measures um, that it's important to make sure are put in place as part of the delivery plan. Um, if you don't know um, and are choosing not to know if that baby is affected or not, you kind of need to err on the side of caution and make sure you're doing everything that you can that if that baby does end up having hemophilia, you're doing everything you can to keep make sure the baby is kept safe. So that would be, in this case, you doing things like making sure that you're not using forceps or vacuum extractors. And again, these are just two examples um, and not every excellent condition is going to have some things like this that impact, but that's why I say it's very important to kind of have a conversation with your medical team. Um, and then that medical team should probably be talking with your obstetrical team um, to help figure out if there are things that need to get put in place as far, to, as, far as a delivery plan. Um, the other thing to really consider is if you choose not to figure out if, um, you know, by any uh, reproductive testing options, if a child is affected with a genetic condition or not, um, there are some where it is especially important that um, you consider uh, testing genetically or with newborn screening in the postnatal setting, um, especially for um, if there's a treatment or a care for a child that is time sensitive. So, so there are some excellent conditions that are considered part of newborn screening where it's felt that kind of awareness of that diagnosis at an early age is very uh, important and time sensitive so that appropriate therapies can be brought on board if the child is turn, does turn out to be affected with the condition. So what are the financial considerations? If you're obviously, if you're choosing not to do um, anything, um, then there really aren't any specific financial considerations um, other than just kind of making sure that you pursue a conversation or those follow-up um, visits with your physician to kind of set a delivery plan. So what really are the next steps? Um, I would uh, emphasize that family planning is your choice. Um, but I would encourage you to always make an active decision. Um, it's in, it's, you should really ensure that you have all the available information about all of your options and then weigh them carefully. So weighing the benefits and the limitations of all of the options. You're already uh, down the road to that, I think, by watching these, uh, these different family planning toolkits, uh, uh, seminars that we've put together, to kind of going over all of the options. So, um, so you're already well on your way. Um, and the other real thing I think would be to talk to your medical team and share your decision. Um, even if your decision is not to pursue any intervention, in, it's important to have your team kind of aware of that and be on board. Um, and then work with your team um, to put any appropriate plans in place. Well, thank you so much for your time and listening to uh, my presentation today about the choice of no intervention. If you have any questions about this or the other options that you're hearing in the family planning toolkit as you work your way through it, um, we would encourage you to reach out to your medical team or to seek contact with a genetic counselor. Um, you can always find a genetic counselor if you are uh, connected with one already uh, by going to www.nsgc.org. Um, take care and be well.